interpreting going. There's an order of operations here I go through to make sure I don't forget any of the steps. Shut that thing off, and I know what I was going to do. I was going to pull up the web page and make an announcement that I put up your first homework. So if you'd like to get started on homework one, knock yourself out. It is not due until March 1st, though, so a couple weeks out. I pushed it back um, as far as I could because I knew that we would end up at least one or two classes behind because I know myself well enough to know that that was going to happen. So there's no rush on that, but if you'd like to find a way to procrastinate on something else you need to be doing yet still feel productive, might I suggest stats homework. It, you can get it finished, you know that you're right, it's, it has this nice like finite completion to it. it. It's good for avoiding tasks that are difficult, like writing things where you're never quite sure when you're done or what to say or how to say it. Um, one caveat though that I wanted to give you about homework one, it is a very different kind of homework than what I'm used to giving and what you've had from me in the past. It is not a data analysis. So the goal of homework one is actually a vocabulary exercise. Even though this is a stats class, it is the vocabulary with which we talk about parameters in the model for the means, so fixed effects, and parameters in the model for the variance, which are random effects, random intercepts is what we had thus far, uh, residual variances, and their covariances. So homework one gives you Num uh, numeric quantities minus two log likelihood and asks you to calculate things. And I know I'm not into hand calculations. I normally don't do that, but my goal is just to see if you can follow the description of what I'm saying the model has in it and how many parameters that would then be. And so that will make more sense as to why that is so tricky as we get further into today's lecture and the next time's lecture. But I just wanted to give you the heads up that it's a different kind of animal of a homework. Um, after that, we'll go back to the usual sort of data analysis kind of framework things. But what that also means is that you don't need any software. So um, not all of you are fluent in SAS or Stata or R and you don't need to worry about software for homework one. All you need is a spreadsheet or a calculator and you'll be just fine. So, uh, yes, looking at the chat window, yes, uh, thank, you, thank you for the commentary. Did I say it was available? It is available. I put it up yesterday. So homework one is available. Um, before you work on that though, if you could make sure that you do your first formative assessment for me uh, by Monday night, then I will look over those answers on Tuesday morning and uh, we can talk about those. I just realized I forgot to mention that to my other class, um, that the last question on here, my favorite question is, uh, what is your theme song? So that's question number five is asking you, so theme song to me is like, if you are a professional athlete and you come up to bat, you go in the game, whatever your, your sport is, what would the song be that plays on the loudspeaker? Like, what is your walk-in music? What is your theme song? So I'd like to, to get each of your theme songs. You can pick the same one that you gave me before, or you can pick a new one. I try to have a new one each semester, so give that some thought. Uh, let's see. I must have a killer playlist by now. Yes. Yes. I just, I forget that I have it is the problem. I need to do a better job of, of corralling them in one place. And folks are saying they don't see homework one available yet. Is that what it's, as I'm seeing? Okay, uh, I will have to check on that. I know I put it up, but it's possible that I didn't set the flag to let you guys all see it yet. So it is done, I just need to fix it then. So, sorry, you're gonna have to go back to writing. No stats homework for you to do in the meantime. My bad. Or find some other way to spend the weekend besides stats homework. I know, it's a very sad day, but we're gonna persevere. All right, so what were we talking about last time? You get the nice, prettier background. Tell me what you remember from last time. I'm watching the chat window, or you can speak. You can unmute yourself and actually talk if you feel like it.
Here's some comments. Compound symmetry to split variance into two piles between and within models. Yeah. So yeah, all of that. The idea of two piles of variance. We're taking what is all of the deviations between a given observation and the sample mean, and we're splitting that into two piles, or two variance components, by the way. When you write manuscripts, you are not allowed to say piles. That's not cool. These are variance components. But in this class, they're piles. And the idea of a compound symmetry model is that we are splitting the variance into what is between persons, level two, due to mean differences, due to the U0 random intercept, versus what is within persons, level one, residual, intra-individual variation represented with ease. There, yeah, those are all the, the vocabulary words. Not surprisingly, uh, your first formative assessment is drilling vocabulary, getting you used to seeing all the synonyms of ways of describing these things. And what is the point of doing that? It's a nice heuristic to talk about how much variance is due to each kind, but why do we care? Why does it matter? It matters because of the standard error? Yeah, standard error of your fixed effects. So standard errors are based on your model for the variance. More specifically, what should go into them depends on what kind of predictor they are and what kind of variance they could possibly explain. So in the example that we saw, we had the difference between pretest and post-test time as a predictor. Well, that predictor can only predict within person variance over time. Time cannot predict why some people are higher or lower all the time, which is between person variance. So we don't want that between person random intercept variance in the numerator of the standard error for our time fixed effect. We do still need it in the level two person predictors though, but then we need to make sure we have the right degrees of freedom because we don't have as many rows as we have people. We have multiple rows per person. And so the degrees of freedom get messed up if you, the model doesn't understand that. So yeah, um, more technically, I guess, the idea that we are doing two piles of variance is allowing a correlation between the outcomes from the same person. It is allowing dependency. So uh, one of the phrases you've heard me say before, when people don't know what they're talking about and they try to describe something in statistics, they use the word handle. Like maximum likelihood handles missing data. Multi-level modeling handles dependency. How it handles it is to make a predicted dependency be part of the model. That is what happens. So after controlling for the U0 and intercept, then we would say that the residuals, the E's at level one, are supposed to be independent. So we're back to the typical assumptions of a general linear model for each of the variance components once we've split them into two. Now, if that's not true, then we need something else in the model. And so that's where we're headed is, well, what else might we possibly need? And how would we know if a random intercept is enough to capture all of the dependency or if there's other kinds that we also have to deal with? So that's what's coming up. All right, any questions or comments before we jump in? Uh, yeah, can you quickly uh, talk about the um, correlation matrix, the ones in the diagonals, what those represent? Let me find where I think you're pointing to. Is it this one? Can't hear you, Farhan. Oh, sorry. Yeah, the matrix on the right, the R core matrix. Yeah, so vocabulary. So the terminology that goes with this two pile structure, when you tell the software to put both piles in the same place. So that's the type of model that we looked at last time where we had a repeated statement or we had a correlation statement and we told it what kind of correlation to put in. The R matrix here on the left is the variance covariance matrix across outcomes from the same person. 
So the diagonal is the variance at each occasion. The off diagonals are the covariances between occasions. And so if we had a three occasion example, that's what this would look like. The R core matrix is the cor correlation matrix version of this covariance matrix. And so the ones are on the diagonal because all variances have been standardized to one. And the correlation, the covariances, excuse me, have been converted into correlations via the usual correlation formula here. And so this is the exact same thing as you first learned in thinking about how we take covariance between two outcomes and convert it into Pearson's correlation. That's the same formula. The difference is that what we used to just call Pearson correlation now has a special name here, which is intraclass correlation, because it describes the expected correlation of occasions from the same level two person. It also describes the proportion of variability in the outcome that is due to between person differences, that is due to random intercept differences. So you can think okay, about that it. either way, just say. Yep. Okay. Is that better? So, yeah. So the variances just get turned into uh, correlations and they're one in their correlation version. The variances are standardized to one. So you can think of like if we took each of the occasions and standardize, standardize them into z-scores, then this is what we'd get. The variances would be one, and the covariances between them are now correlations. OK, got it. Thank you. Sure. And this R matrix structure here, that idea that each variance is part U and part E, and that all of the covariances are only because of this random intercept variance, that idea is called compound symmetry. And I don't know about you guys, but the first time that I saw the off diagonals here, which I just said were covariances, what goes in those places is actually a variance. I was like, wah! Does anyone else think that that's strange? Like, why is there a variance where my covariance is supposed to be? And the way that I can explain that is just to say what this model is saying is that the only reason that there is a covariance between occasions from the same person is because some people are higher than others. Some people are higher than others all the time. Person mean differences, that's what the random intercept is capturing. That is causing, predicting the covariance. And it's the only thing that is according to this model. So this model could be wrong in practice. And we will get a chance to see empirically how to test how this predicted compound symmetry structure compares to what the data actually have as the variance covariance matrix. Because it's possible that the variance changes over time, and it's possible that the covariance changes depending on which pair of occasions you're talking about. Those are both highly likely to occur in many kinds of longitudinal data. Okay. Other thoughts, questions? All right, that's actually a beautiful segue. I couldn't have planned that any better, so thank you, into where we're headed for new territory. Kinds of ANOVAs. So this, <laughs> I feel like a radio DJ. This slide's going out to all my repeated measures ANOVA psychology graduate students. This one's for you. When I first started teaching this at Nebraska, I was in a psych department, the same psych department I did my undergraduate work in, by the way, I, I came home again. And like they were taught their first year all about repeated measures ANOVA, and that was all the designs that they used in their research. And so like that was the way that I had to get into these models. And so I had to describe how these things differ, yes or no, in what ways they differ from what they already know. Um, because I knew all of this was coming, I made a dedicated decision in intro stat, those of you who had 6242 with me, to not even touch this. Because I didn't want to have to undo it. <laughs> because it turns out that doing any kind of multivariate or repeated measures analysis using least squares is highly problematic. 
And so I didn't even want to waste my time on it. I wanted you to come straight to this class and learn how to do it the right way. So if these slides are like, what is she even talking about? It's totally fine if you've never heard this before. But if you're coming from a more traditional um, mixed design or what split plot is what it's called, where you'd have like a repeated measures factor plus between groups factors, that kind of language, I wanted to, to put what we're talking about in that context for you. So this one's going out to the repeated measures crowd. So when we say the word analysis of variance or ANOVA, there's actually three different kinds. And I was only taught two of them in any detail. And the third, I was like, huh, I vaguely remember hearing about that, but then it never showed up again. So the kinds are between persons or between groups, univariate repeated measures or multivariate repeated measures. All of them have in common the fact that you cannot have missing occasions if you are using least squares estimation. So the problem is not ANOVA per se with respect to missing data, it's the use of least squares, which is generally what ANOVA is referring to. So we're solving that problem by switching to maximum likelihood estimation and its cousin residual maximum likelihood. More details on that are forthcoming. Um, I thought between groups ANOVA was just the regular flavor. Maybe. Between groups ANOVA would be what it is in a if each subject is in only one condition. So the, I learned that as independent groups ANOVA or between groups, between person would be the language that would apply in this class. So perhaps from the perspective that whoever was teaching you, that was the regular flavor. It depends on what you use most commonly, what's regular and what's, I'm going to go with diet or low sodium. I don't know what the, what the alternative to regular flavor is anymore. But in this case here, so none of these, you can have missing occasions, missing data whatsoever. None of them directly allow time varying predictors. So if you wanted to introduce a covariate, and by covariate I mean a quantitative predictor that goes into the model along with that, it is a between groups predictor. It is not a time varying predictor. What they have in common with respect to how they treat repeated occasions is that they force them to be discrete. So the term for this vocabulary word, saturated means, that is what ANOVA uses, meaning it treats the time variable as a categorical predictor. So if I had four occasions, a saturated means model for time would look like this. In SAS, for instance, the fourth occasion would be the reference group. So that would be given by the intercept. T1 would be the difference between the reference and time one. And then T2 is the difference between uh, the reference and time two and then time three. So it's a categorical predictor. There would be as many fixed effects as you have categories. So one intercept and then a number of categories minus one slopes. So that means that everybody has to fit neatly into one of these four boxes, right? There is everybody has a time one, a time two, a time three. Somebody who was late coming into their time two appointment and showed up at time two and a half, where are you going to put them? You got to put them in one of the boxes to make this work. And it's not good to put people in boxes. You got to let them be free. So we're going to treat time as a quantitative variable, which means that we can have intermediate values. And the terminology that goes with each person having multiple possible distinct versions of a time variable is unbalanced. If not, not everybody's measured on the exact same schedule, that is an unbalanced design. Uh, the analog in cluster data would be if each cluster has different numbers of individuals. We would call that unbalanced. It's the same type of concern here. So all of these kinds of ANOVAs treat time as a categorical predictor. The way that they differ is in their model for the variance. So they all fit the exact same model for the means with respect to time. They differ in how they, they stipulate the model for the variance in what kind of dependency they predict happens for the occasions from the same person. That is how they differ. Okay, with me so far. 
All right, now I'm holding a microphone, by the way, after I started that. It's like I'm doing stats karaoke or something. I don't even know. But I think I've had too much caffeine. I think that's the problem. I'm going to push that over here, push my water bottle within reach, take it down a notch. Okay. Can I ask a question that's probably overly simplistic? Variance versus covariance. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Variance and covariance? Yeah, the difference between them. Um, the diagonal versus the off diagonals. So variance is a uh, property of one variable. It describes the distribution of each case relative to the mean in a squared terminology. So standard deviation is how far off on average each case is from the mean. You square that, you get variance. Covariance refers to a pair of variables. Gotcha. So common variance in the two. And so then that is how far off each is from the mean multiplied together. Thank you. Sure. So covariance is a measure of association, whereas variance is a measure of dispersion. So in, um, Katie says this is regular flavor between groups and NOVA. It's designed for independent groups. There is no dependency because each person is supposed to be from a different condition. So if you applied this model to a design in which condition was occasion, what it says is that there is no dependency. So this is the E only model that we looked at in example 3A, where what it predicts is the same variance for every occasion. So this would be for a four occasion example, E variance at time one, time two, time three, time four, and this, the zeros here are the blank spots in the SAS output, meaning that there is no expected covariance between time one and time two, time one and time three, time one and time four, and so on. So not only is the variance the same across time, it's all in one pile. And because it's all in one pile, the off diagonals, stop it, have a zero. So this is the Variance components structure, as it is called in SAS, it is also known as an, uh, a diagonal or identity matrix sometimes when you, when you put ones on it and then bring the sigma squared E term out front. This is uh, inde independent, I think, in Stata, and this is null in R, and I think it's diagonal in SPSS, but don't quote me on that. That's from memory, and I haven't seen that code in quite a while. So this is likely to be very wrong for longitudinal data. It is likely to be very wrong in the context of cluster data as well, although not quite as wrong, because the correlation between occasions from the same person tends to be larger than the correlation of people from the same group. So this is sort of a, a, the wrongest model. We typically wouldn't even entertain this for longitudinal data. With, this, is the, this is why there is a difference between a between groups ANOVA and a repeated measures ANOVA is because this is not gonna work for repeated measures. So then two kinds of repeated measures. This is our friend compound symmetry. Compound symmetry, where we have level two random intercept variance plus level one residual variance between person plus within person on the diagonal and all between person mean differences on the off diagonals. That is what is known as the univariate approach to repeated measures ANOVA. So this is a very strict assumption that each occasion has the same total variability and that how the occasions relate to each other is irregardless, I heard that's a word now, irregardless of time. The dictionary added it. It's, it's fair game now. And I say irregardless to make us like really like a point that, yeah, wouldn't you think that occasion one and two would be more related than occasion one and four? Probably not according to this model. This model says equal variance over time, equal covariance over time. And it's probably going to be wrong for most types of longitudinal data. So if people differ in how they change over time, 
So that's given by the second little picture here. What has to happen if people change differently is that the variance changes as a function of time too. People spread out or they narrow, right? One of the two is gonna happen. So the only situation in which compound symmetry is gonna work is if there's parallel lines, if people change the same, if the only thing that differentiates people is their intercept, their shift on the y-axis and that's it. And even in fluctuation data, so maybe people don't change at all and there's just lines that are flat, in fluctuation data, it's unlikely that occasions that are really far apart would be as related as occasions that are really close together. So for fluctuation data, the diagonal might be okay of equal variance, but the off diagonals all being the same, probably not gonna work. So this is the univariate approach to repeated measures ANOVA, compound symmetry, only thing that differs between people is a random intercept. With me so far. I wait for it, I get the yellow thumbs. So the problem then, what happens if the idea that all of the occasions have the same variance isn't true? Well, same problem that we talked about with respect to any model for the variance being wrong, standard errors for the fixed effects are wrong. So if you want to talk about the differences between occasions, that presupposes having only one amount of variance, that all of those comparisons should be done using the same error term. But if there's less variance at certain occasions than others, then comparisons using just that one error term are going to be either too lenient or too conservative, depending on whether that occasion has less variance than predicted or more. So all of it gets messed up. Um, the old way of fixing the problem in least squares land relies on the idea of sphericity and corrections for sphericity. That's a mouthful. Um, the technical matrix definitions are things I don't even want to bore you with, but in English, what sphericity means is that the pairwise differences between occasions have equal variance. So it's not as strict as compound symmetry, but it's related. And so if sphericity is violated, then univariate repeated measures ANOVA is not going to give you the correct inferences, and you have to fix it somehow. So the fixes that you may have seen are based on some parameter here, this E-looking thing, for corrections to sphericity. So there's like a bunch of of uh, like old statisticians who named this stuff after themselves, like the greenhouse geyser and the wind felt, and there's like a whole list of like four or five of them that show up on your output, and they all have a different version of how to fix it using this epsilon thing that just takes your whole model and makes it more conservative, but it doesn't actually solve the problem that the model that you're starting with doesn't fit. And so the alternative then is, Okay, fine. Let everything be what it wants. I'm not going to force any kind of pattern. You just, you do your thing. Our matrix, you go. So that's the multivariate approach to repeated measures ANOVA, or what people would call MANOVA. And that is no structure whatsoever. Each occasion gets its own variance. Fine. Each pair of occasions gets its own covariance. Fine. Can't be wrong. No problem. Uh, those of you who were in SEM will recognize this idea as the H1 model. Everything gets to be what it wants. It's the best case model. It's the, it's the one with the highest likelihood that fits the best. In this class, it's going to be the unstructured model. So H1 in SEM terms re refers to both all the, the variances and covariances get to be what they want and the means get to be what they want. In this class, we separate the two. So the idea that each of the means is estimated separately is saturated means. The idea that each of the variances and covariances gets to be what they want is unstructured. So you can have either, neither, or both, depending on how you set up your model. And so this unstructured R matrix is a fine idea 
if you don't have very many occasions. And by very many, I mean like two, three, four. After that, it starts to be not as good of an idea. The number of total parameters that would have to be estimated, the number of total variances and covariances, depends on your number of occasions. Here's the little formula. So if I have, say, 10 occasions, then I have 10 times 11, which is 110, divided by 2, which is 55 parameters to estimate, and I haven't even gotten to the model I care about yet. That means at a minimum you need at least 55 people to make that thing work, and that's not going to be estimated very well. It is frequently the case that repeated measures designs, because you're measuring people repeatedly, don't have as many observations. So this becomes impractical. And even if you can estimate it to the extent that you don't need something that complicated, it's wasteful in terms of parameters and it can potentially hurt your power. So this is a convenient baseline. If you just had a pre-test, post-test design, this is what I would do. So I got, an, uh, I got a question from um, someone who's watching these videos. Apparently there's other people following along with this class. Hello, audience, back at home. If you have a pre-test, post-test design, this is what I do. I would call it a multivariate model where I predict pre-test and I predict post-test simultaneously. I let them each have their own variance left over and whatever covariance they want, and I'm done. I don't multi-level model it. I don't worry about random anything. I just let it be because it's three parameters. It's going to be fine. If I had three occasions, I'd probably still do this and call it good. It's once you get more than that where you have to worry about estimating too many parameters that it's a problem, but it's also a problem with respect to unbalanced data. So unbalanced data means when each person has a different potential set of time values. Having this one matrix presupposes that everybody fits neatly into the boxes, right? You can't have a row for a person who came in at time 1.2 and another row for time 1.4, and another row for 2.7, and another row for 3.8, and all the different possible rows, you can't summarize unbalanced data with just one matrix. So you can't do this. So this answer key, the idea that just let it be what it wants and it will be right, isn't always possible. And so that's why the options that are available to you within this multi-level framework give us ways to predict these patterns using fewer than all possible parameters and ways that allow us to do so for unbalanced data at the same time. So there's nothing wrong with ANOVA when it fits and when it's possible, but there are better approaches potentially that I want you to be aware of. Okay. Mm -hmm. this, yeah, this type... Go for it. Might be a silly question, but um, could you, what, so how would you check for fit in this case, or how would you be able to tell whether it fit or not? Oh, what a great question. Get in there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that segue. Yes. So that, that's where we're going. Um, so summarizing here. All of the ANOVAs have the same model for the means. They all treat time as a categorical variable, estimate as many fixed effects as there are occasions. That's fine, but it doesn't allow you to have unbalanced occasions, and it doesn't allow you to summarize the pattern of means with a functional form. So most of the time, people don't have hypotheses about how time one differs from time two, and time two differs from time three, and time three differs from time four. No, they say, how do people change over time? And how do people change differently as a function of some other thing? That implies a functional form that describes the change through the means that we can then refer to and moderate as part of a linear model. The models for the variance differ in the kind of dependency they allow. Between groups, ANOVA says none. Univariate approach to repeated measures says compound symmetry, only one kind, constant dependency due to a random intercept. 
and multivariate re uh, repeated measures. Nova says, fine, whatever, any kind you want, don't care, just make it work. So we are going to see differences in what our options are on both sides. Fixed effects related to time that allow us to put functional forms through the mean, and that allows us to fit unbalanced data as well. And on the variance side, we're going to add other random effects besides an intercept, such as random slopes that allow people to change differently, and other patterns of correlation of the residuals besides none or all the same. So more choices is where we're going here. It's like a smorgasbord of models. All right. Can I, before I do, let me think about what's best. Let's take a vote. We'll make this an interactive experience. Do you want to see an example of fitting these models in software, or do you want me to tell you, how do I know which one's right? So I'll, one finger, for example, two fingers for how do I know which one's right as our next topic. Oh, everybody wants, it looks like one finger. <laughs> Touche, Kelly. Oh, it, it looks like the twos have it, though. So we'll, we'll do a, how do I know this is right? And then we'll see the example in which I demonstrate how to know this is right. OK, thanks for the voting. So the good news is that you probably already know the answer to this. If you have done generalized linear models using likelihood ratio tests, or if you've done SEM using likelihood ratio tests, this is that. If you haven't seen this before, that's cool, uh, because there's actually additional layers of complexity to this that show up in our models that don't show up in those. So the two questions that we have to ask ourselves in terms of structuring a model for the variance thus far, um, does the residual variance differ across occasions? So is the diagonal need to be one thing or many things? And is the idea of a constant correlation across time sufficient? or is there more to the pattern? So there's really two different sets of decisions we can be wrong about. And the way that we're going to do this is to look at measures of fit for one model and pit it against another. And what fit means, the idea that should go along with this in your head, is height. Uh, in a couple weeks, we're going to get more details on this, but I will just tell you briefly, fit is the sum across all observations in the data of height of the data using the multivariate normal distribution as the formula for computing height. So the model parameters get chosen as the ones that make the data the tallest given that model. And so then we try and fit another model and it chooses the model parameters that make the data the tallest under that alternative model and then we see which one's taller. So height is log likelihood. Likelihood is height of the multivariate normal distribution in this case. So more is better if you're talking about height. More likely, more taller, better fit. But to do something with that height, we end up having to multiply it by minus two because the differences in height follow a chi-square distribution if they're multiplied by minus 2. So because you're going to have to do that additional step, some software packages try to make it easier on you, and they spit out your height times, times minus 2 to begin with. So they spit out shortness instead of height. Because when you take a height and multiply it by minus 2, then Smaller values are better, not bigger values. So in this process of doing these likelihood ratio tests, as it is known, it is a difference in heights. If you are given minus 2 log likelihood on your output, which is what you get in SAS and in Stata, then you just take the difference between the model that has fewer parameters to start with minus the minus 2 log likelihood of the model with more parameters. So this difference should always be a positive number. The worst it can be is 0. 
If it's negative, you've done something wrong. If you are given height instead of shortness, log likelihood, uh, height equals density, yes. Height of a mountain, I'm going to go with in multiple dimensional space, yes, height though. Like if you picture a, a bivariate normal distribution, or a normal distribution, right, just a regular, regular hump, right, you have height in one dimension. If I were to do a bivariate normal distribution of two variables at the same time, it looks like a taco, like it's like a height of a, of a mountain if there's a relationship. So I, I can't make hand gestures for three or more dimensions, but height is a concept that you can hang on to. So if you're given log likelihood, lost my mouse here, one second, there we go, which is what you get in M plus, which is what you get in R as far as I've seen so far, then you have to take the difference between the log likelihoods and multiply it by minus two. So once you do one of these two things, you end up with the same number either way. And that number is an index of how much better the model that has more stuff in it fits relative to the model that has less stuff, more parameters relative to fewer parameters. And that number is treated as a chi-square. So then you can compare that chi-square as a test statistic relative to degrees of freedom for the number of things you've added. And you can use your software to get yourself an exact p-value that goes with that chi-square test. You can use the chi-dist function in Excel. You can use a function called lrtest in Stata. There's a function in R called ANOVA. And I have written a function for SAS to do this as well. So in any package, you can do this. Have it do it for you to uh, speed things along. So any model has a height. We can tell whether a model is better than another one by whether or not it is taller as a function of the difference between the models. Okay, how are we doing? Eh, eh, eh. All right, eh. We'll get there. This takes some practice, but it's not too bad once you get used to it. So in terms of what the difference between models means, how you talk about it, it depends on whether your goal is to improve model fit or to simplify without hurting it. So if you start with a model with one thing in it and you compare it to a model that has three things in it, your goal is to make it better. So you added two things. Does the height grow enough for those two things to call it significantly better? If yes, you'd say it fits significantly better. If the height grows but not enough to cross the threshold, then it's not better. But you haven't made it worse. You can only make it better or not better if you're adding things. Relative to the other direction, let's say that I'm starting with an unstructured matrix where all the variances and covariances are estimated separately, and I want to see, say, if compound symmetry is close enough. So compound symmetry is taking parameters away. It is simplifying. In that case, my model comparison is whether or not compound symmetry fits worse or not worse. Because you know if you take parameters away, fit has to go down. It's a question of whether it goes down significantly, in which case, yeah, you heard it too much, you need to keep the one that had more stuff in it. So we will see instances of both of these this semester. What we're doing in our current context, looking at the model for the variance and whether unstructured is necessary or whether it's overkill, is the latter here. Relative to unstructured, how much worse are the simpler alternatives? We also get additional fit statistics that are functions of minus two log likelihood that try to take into account the number of parameters that we added and to penalize us accordingly. So there is AIC and there is BIC, and each of them starts with minus two log likelihood. So what that means is that even if your software is giving you log likelihood instead of minus two log likelihood, it gives you AIC and BIC in the minus two log likelihood scale. So smaller is better for those two 
indices. They're known as information criteria. The catch, in terms of what the parameters means that goes into this formula, depends on which side of the model that you're in. Now I thought that that was just the case universally until I started messing about in other software packages and realized that both Stata and R get this wrong. They count all the parameters in both. So in your first homework, you, there's instructions to, to use this slide. It's actually the same slide that's given in lecture four that I refer to, but it's the same idea. And so your task is going to be to figure out based on which flavor of likelihood the question is referring to, how many parameters are in the model? How many parameters count towards AIC and BIC? Because there is regular flavor maximum likelihood and there is residual maximum likelihood. And only the variance model counts in residual maximum likelihood because that's all it's trying to maximize is the residuals. So the, the idea of fit gets more complicated because of this Remmel versus Emmel distinction. Residual maximum likelihood, Remmel, is only a thing in this context. There is no such thing as Remmel for generalized models like IRT, like logistic regression. There is no such thing as Remmel in structural equation modeling software, which is why you never heard me say boo about this before. So Remmel is a, is a unique thing for this set of models. But the idea is the same regardless of which type of estimation you use. You're trying to see how much taller your model got by adding parameters or how much shorter you made it by taking them away. Okay, here's my two flavors of likelihood. So you've seen this slide before, just to remind you, conceptually the difference boils down to this difference in the formula for variance. It's a lot more complicated than that, but I find this to be a useful heuristic for understanding the difference between the two. If you have the population version of the variance formula, the denominator is n, and if you have a sample version, it's n minus however many fixed effects it took to get to that variance. This difference loosely corresponds to the difference between Remmel and Emmel. ML does not pay attention to how many fixed effects were in the model for the means to get to this variance. Remmel does. So the variances that you end up with are more correct for Remmel, especially in small samples. That's why it's used in multi-level and mixed models. If you're doing SEM or logistic regression or things like that, they sort of assume that you already have huge samples and so you're not going to have to worry about the downward bias of variance components that would happen during regular flavor maximum likelihood. So we're staying in this, this semester. I don't, I'm trying to think if I have any examples that go outside of this, maybe one or two, but it's going to be Remmel for the most part here because Remmel corresponds to least squares if it's complete data and it has the most correct version of the variance components if you have small numbers of people, which is often the case in longitudinal data. So I have like a bunch of slides that all say the same thing <laughs> because over the years I've like had different ideas for how I could present this and I gave up deciding which one I like best and so these are the rules for variance model comparisons under Remmel versus Emmel. The big picture is that if you're in Remmel, any time that you want to compare different models for the variance, they have to have the same fixed effects. So when we compare models, we'll make sure that whatever fixed effects are there are the same and we'll focus only on what's going on the variant side and then it's fine. If you do that, you're home free. If you try to do anything else, then you have to pay attention. So in ML, you can do any kind of model comparison. You can change the model for the means or you can change the model for the variance or both of them at the same time. In ML, it's all fine. Can't do that in Remmel. So I have a table as to what you can and cannot do as a function of 
this combination. And this set of rules is what homework one is about. So which kinds of model comparisons are valid under Remmel versus Emmel, and making sure that the fewer versus more parameters distinction is correct as well. So this is a not a super complex set of rules, but it takes some practice. And so that's what I want you to practice is the modeling vocabulary interspersed with these rules. So there's a couple different ways of saying that. And then we can look at an example that follows them. All right, how are we doing? The correct answer on a Thursday at three o'clock is, I'm not sure about this, Lisa, I'm not sure. Height, okay, I'll believe you. Let's see an example. Will that make it better? Put some numbers on there? I think that always makes it better for me. I have a really hard time with abstract concepts. <laughs> I'm still here, so there's that. Correct. That is correct. And I appreciate you all hanging in there and staying here. Even if some of you are sliding off camera a bit. That's okay. All right, I'm pulling up example 3B. It's only three models. It's the kinds of ANOVAs illustrating model comparisons between the two of them. The good news is that this example comes straight out of the second half of chapter three. It requires no data manipulation whatsoever. It's starting with a stacked data set in which it's one row per occasion per person. It is a, a study that was used also in chapter six, and I wanna go with 11 also. It's used in a couple other chapters in the book. It's real data, actually. And it is a study of older adults, and the outcome is response time to a measure of processing speed. And it is six occasions that occur over a two week period. So it is a very simple cognitive task where they see two rows of three numbers each, and they have to hit a button as fast as they can as to whether each row has the same numbers in it or different numbers. So it's a very simple measure of processing speed. The backstory to why this da these data were collected, so this is work from Marty Slowinski at uh, formerly of Syracuse University, now at Penn State University, and my former postdoc mentor when he was at Penn State, Scott Hofer, they were interested in studying the effects of aging and whether or not there were ways to somehow hack those models to control for practice effects. Because when you measure people repeatedly, they get better at whatever you're asking them to do. We call that practice or intervention or training or things like that, right? But in older adults, you would expect them over time to decline to some extent as a function of health or other sorts of problems. So in the aging literature, there was this whole debate about whether you could trust longitudinal studies of older adults because how much of what you're seeing is practice effects and how much of what you're seeing is aging? Well, the short answer is that no, statistical models cannot solve design-related confounds like that, and I have a paper about that I can give you if you're interested, but the solution is to change the design. So this was one wave of what is known as a measurement burst design. So they collected six occasions from these older adults over a two-week period. The goal was to study practice effects in the absence of aging. People are not going to age in a two-week period. So what we're seeing is purely just exposure to the test. How much faster are they at this task after they've done it six times? They then take that same set of six observations and repeat it at six months intervals. So they have a burst of six separated by six months, another burst, and then another burst. And so then you can look at the effects of longer term aging, not just in a one shot assessment, but in things like the asymptotic performance after practice has happened, or the rate of improvement, if, is that slowing down as a function of aging? So this is just one burst of the story. We're studying over six balance occasions, changes in response time. So response time is supposed to go down if you're faster. So this is an outcome in which lower scores are better. 
that's my story. So I am simply importing the data in each of my programs. Uh, by the way, uh, Kayla, I tried your trick with the setting working directory, and then I realized that I was going to have to type my path more than once to be able to use it in other places in my code, and so I gave up and went back to my crazy mix of uh, directions for slashes thing. But I appreciate the help. So we're importing the data uh, and putting it in. Yeah. Is it because you have everything saved in different places? No, um, I ended up having to like put it here to try and read in the data set and then the, the code that generates the text file, I needed it to use there too. So anytime that I'm gonna have to paste a path multiple places in the same file, I try to represent it with some sort of program variable at the beginning. So um, I can live with the crazy mix of slashes because in this class, I only have to change like the end of my path across all of my examples because they're all in the same folder. So. It works for me, but if you can make it work for you differently, then so be it. Okay, so that's good to know. I just, I don't understand that because yeah, usually for like my stuff, if I save everything to the same working directory, like I don't have a problem with it running. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously I try to keep it separate based on what project I'm in, but mm -hmm. yeah, I don't, it, I don't have an answer, <laughs> I don't know. I got a couple errors and I was not in the mood to troubleshoot. I was like, fine. I don't right? blame you. Yeah, it's like, no, it, I'm, it worked before. I'm going to stick it with that way. So, mm -hmm. yes, I am a, an R novice. And once I find one way to do it and it works consistently, I'm inclined to, to not mess with it, even though it's probably inefficient. I so, mean, arguably, I am as well. <laughs> There's think, so much to R. Yeah, R is crazy. It's just crazy. Mm -hmm. It's like this world of functions that everyone has made and everyone makes them differently. And so there's no consistency and like, ugh. yeah. I do a lot of Google consulting <laughs> to, well, I refer to Google and it consults me. <laughs> yes, Google University is, is very helpful up to a point. And then you need to like find somebody who understands better to make sure that the Google has not led you astray. So, anywho, so these are the means, and what does it look like based on this mean trend here is happening to response time over time? This is a gesture question. Yeah, they're going down. Now, related question, second column, standard error of the mean. What's happening to that over time? it's going down. So standard error of the mean is a function of sample size, which is all the same in this case, and standard deviation. So what that means is that the standard deviation across people is decreasing over time. People are homogenizing. They are getting closer together as time goes on. So that's a preview as to what kind of model we're gonna need to fit these data. So all of the models in this handout have the same model for the means. This is my predicted response time for time per person is a function of six fixed effects. I have this set up so that time six is the reference. And so these are all would be dummy variables indicating each other occasion relative to time six. And I just updated this handout last week to make sure that session six was the reference group for the other software packages as well. I missed that the first time, so um, I did that additional change. So here is my first model for these data that is the between groups ANOVA. So this is type equals VC for my repeated line in SAS. It is residuals independent in Stata. So this is my E only model that we saw last week. And correlation equals null in SAS. Or nope, R. So each of these models has the exact same model for the means. I am treating session as my time variable as categorical. So I have one intercept and five slopes for session. And the difference across the models in this handout is in the model for the variance. So this is E only, no dependency, 
this is what it would be if I had a cross-sectional anal cross analysis. Okay, any questions on the setup? All right. So here's what the model says. Here's my predicted R matrix. So this is not what's in the data. This is what the model says. The model says the total variance at any one occasion is 236,813, because this is re response time in milliseconds. That's why it's such a crazy big number. But what I want you to notice is that it is the same crazy big number across all six sessions. And what does this giant blank spot in all the off diagonals imply? This is a gesture question. <laughs> I mean, I'll take either nothing or zero. Yeah, no covariance between occasions from the same person. That's what this says. So according to SAS, it's like we have 600 observations and they're all separate. So a one pile model for the variance. So here, this little table we had skipped over before. This is your information criteria. The first column is neg2 log-like. <laughs> so that is negative 2 log likelihood. That is shortness. Smaller is better. So this model has a minus 2 log likelihood. Minus 2 times the sum of the heights in the log scale of 9,155. If that number means nothing to you, that is correct. These numbers have no absolute meaning whatsoever. The only way that they have meaning is relative to a comparison model. How tall could the data possibly be is a function of its scale, the variance of the outcome. So these numbers have no absolute meaning whatsoever. They only have relative meaning. So there's only one parameter in this model according to this because it's only counting the model for the variance. There is one E variance and that is it. Here is the solution for fixed effects. So the intercept gives me the expected outcome mean for my reference group, which is session six. And then these are the successive mean differences relative to session six. I can lump all five of these slopes together to get an overall test of whether there is an omnibus effect of session. Right here, that's done for me. So five degrees of freedom gives me a chi-square of 23. If I divide that chi-square by 5, I get to my f. So I can ask SAS for both chi-square and f for multi-degree of freedom tests. I've got the session means that the model predicts for me. So putting these slopes back together again, for instance, if I take the predicted intercept, which is the mean at session six, and I add to it the mean difference to get to ses se session one, I get to what the mean actually is. So treating your time variable as categorical in the syntax allows you to get all possible means and mean differences quite easily. So this model says that the mean gets to be whatever it wants across occasions. So the predicted means here show the same pattern that we saw in the original data. They do decline over time. But what about the standard error of the mean? It's all the same, but in the data it declined. So this pry isn't going to work. <laughs> so here are all the differences of the means every possible combination of two, and note the standard error is all the same for those. Yeah. So that's probably not...
realistic to say there's no dependency. What if we just throw a compound symmetry univariate repeated measures ANOVA at it? That should help, right? So now we're doing the U plus E variant structure. That shows up right here in SAS. Type equals compound symmetry. So this is our two pile model where I have level two random intercept differences and level one residual differences. That shows up in Stata as exchangeable. And that shows up in R, GLS, as core comp sim. Everything else is the same. So now, this is what the model predicts for my R matrix. The variance is still predicted to be the same across time because that's what compound symmetry says. But now, rather than having no covariance across time, there is a covariance there is generated by the random intercept variance. So that covariance translates into that number right there, which is a correlation. It has a special name. Do you remember the special name for my correlation of occasions from the same person? I'm not sure this is a gesture question, but you can try. Correlation of occasions from the same person has a special name. Yeah, intraclass. Yes, ICC. This is an intraclass correlation after controlling for time, but it's the same idea. According to this model, the residuals from the same person are correlated 0.86 on average. So this pattern right here, where it's 0.86 everywhere, this is what Stata means by exchangeable. Like it doesn't matter if it's session one and session two or session one and session six, they're all exchangeable. The correlation between them is equal, depend, no matter which occasion that you're talking about. So the two parameters then that make up our model are given in the blue down here. So the 202677, that's my random intercept variance. That's differences due to the mean between persons. Some people are faster than others, the end. The residual variance, some occasions are better than others within a person. That's only 34,000. And if you sum those two numbers, you get to what the diagonal is in R. So the total variance in the R matrix on the diagonal is a sum of the random intercept variance at level two and the residual variance at level one. So the question for us then, this model says the residuals are correlated 0.86. Do you think that fits better than saying the residuals are correlated zero? What do you think? You think a correlation of 0.86 is significant? I'd say odds are good. And lo and behold, that test is given to us directly. So in SAS and in Stata, not in R as far as I know, but I could be wrong, this is a likelihood ratio test, a model comparison of heights. So the minus two log likelihood from this current model, the 8353 right here, that differs from the previous model by 802. So we have reduced minus two log likelihood, which means the model is better because we're in shortness because it's multiplied by minus two. 
So a chi-square of 802 on one degree of freedom is significant. So yeah, there's definitely at least some dependency between these residuals. This model says the dependency is all the same, though. So there's one more that we'll have to compare against it next time. Okay, how are we doing? So the answer to your question, I think that was Andrea like 40 minutes ago or something. How do I know if this is better? Is because this number here is smaller than this number here. That's how we know. The difference in minus 2 log likelihood. So next time then we'll get to the uh, multivariate repeated measures ANOVA comparison and then into lecture 4 which gives you a whole bunch of other ones that you can only have in the world of Remmel estimation. So leaving ANOVA land for now. All right, any questions before we adjourn? All right, then thanks for hanging in there. Hope to see you next time. Uh, work on formative assessment number one, and I will figure out what's wrong with homework one, and I will see you next week. So take care. Office hours start now.